Hello and welcome back again to my channel and uh, thank you for tuning in again. On the last video I reviewed a Greco superpower I have to the side here. We can talk about the comparisons in a minute. And that was a 1980, um, maybe it was 82. I don't know. We'll talk about that too. But this is the other Greco that I talked about receiving in the mail and it came from Australia. I mentioned um, the shop that I got it from mojostompboxes.com. I saw that they changed their reverb store name to Classic Guitars or something. I'll, I'll put a link in the video. I'm not endorsing them or anything weird like that. But he seems to have a pretty good shop and he seems to have uh, good prices on on these quality made in Japan guitars from that era or even in the modern area he has a lot of newer ones I mean Tokai and uh, Greco and others are, are still cranking out quality Les Pauls and, and other guitars original guitars too so this is a 78 EG 500 and what caught my eye immediately was the top now I thought this was kind of a, a mixture between a curly and a flame top. Uh, in the video I'll show it's got a lot of movement for what it is. Uh, but actually I learned that they use sycamore tops occasionally. And this is sycamore. And I just fell in love with the different characteristics and the uniqueness of this top. So I thought I would just... Uh, pick it up and see how it played. It came out of the box really nice. It didn't need a whole lot of setup. Uh, I did run into a problem with the bridge pickup, so that is one knock against that shop is what happened. One of the coils went out, so it was reading about six ohms. And you know, after I was done working on it, I thought I should have filmed the whole thing. People, people like watching um, other people work on things, soldering things, soldering things. And I do a lot of that, so I'm going to try to remember to capture that stuff next time I do it. Because I spent about an hour and a half or so on this. Um, and, and what I saw was that they were both reading a little over 6. 6K, I guess, is what it is. But anyway, um, and I noticed that the two, it's a, it's a three-conductor ground and two-conductor pickup. And I noticed both of them um, were soldered together. And so that's not how it should be for a proper humbucker pickup. Um, one of them needs to be just floating, basically. You just tape it off. And so once I took the wires off and I read them, this was coming in a little over 12K. And, and this one was coming in at about um, 6.8. So... I immediately deduced that that pickup was bad and I went to my stock of other pickups. I had a, a nice um, DiMarzio that was real high output. It was like 16K and it was black. Um, and I had an old Yamaha pickup that was cream that I thought would look nice in there, but um, it, it had a bad coil too. So I made sure to Sharpie that so I didn't uh, run into that in the future. but. I had this nondescript, probably Chinese pickup with the chrome cover, and I thought, okay, I'll just drop that in there and see how it sounds, because it measured about 12, too, so I thought it'd be a good pairing. And while I was at it, I wired it up so it would be out of phase in the middle position. I've discussed that and set the other Greco up that way, too. I, I really like that. I think it's kind of a secret weapon with Les Pauls and uh, other guitars, you know, anything that you can get out of phase pickups on. You can do it with single coils and P90s and everything else. And I just think it adds a real distinctive tone. And it also gives you a lot of flexibility when both pickups are on and it's out of phase. The volume changes um, make a drastic effect on the tone. So it gives you a, a great deal of flexibility. But another thing that I wanted to talk about just briefly in, in general about guitars and there's some controversy on this, is the tailpiece height. And wrap around, so when you wrap the strings around and over the tailpiece, 
as opposed to the way this is and how it comes stock is through the back of the tailpiece and over. Now that all depends on, to me, and you know everything I've read, the, the height of the bridge as opposed to the height of the tailpiece. Now if you've got the tailpiece cranked down to the body, which a lot of people believe, and I have some belief in it too, it, that it gives you more tone to the body, the string resonance and vibrations to the body if, if that's cranked all the way down and solid against the body. But the problem is when the bridge is so high, these strings will touch the back of the bridge and that creates a lot of um, problems with tone and it also tightens up your string tension a lot. I can't remember what they call the uh, un unwanted buzz that that happens um, when you when you have that touching the back of the bridge. So depending on the bridge height to me is where you depend on if you're going to leave it stock or if you're going to do a wrap around. Now this thing after I strung it up um, this is a different bridge it's not like a Nashville it's the Made in Japan bridge has a little lower profile and it's not touching the back of those um, of that bridge the strings aren't but I do like to do that rather than having the, the tailpiece cranked up really high in order to prevent that phenomenon that problem so yeah I'm a big fan and my buddy Mike actually kind of turned me on to that and he hadn't been playing guitar for that long when he when he told me about that and I did a lot of research on it and it's true uh, wraparound is a good way to go depending on how high you're and that all comes down to the neck angle and everything else the way they set it up in the factory so something to consider and talk about just in general about Les Pauls and Gibson uh, guitars and other guitars like SG's and whatever else might use a, a tailpiece and a separate bridge assembly but anyway I just kind of wanted to mention that because I'm a believer and I, I learned something and a lot of my guitars have a wraparound uh, string over the tailpiece now too let's get into the specifics of this really cool and well-worn you know especially the back I'm real thankful that the the front the top doesn't have the wear that this back does uh, because the tops actually in pretty good shape despite a few dings and cracks I mean it's a 1978 right so you know that's a survivor and it's pretty much all stock and um, you know a lot of people there's a lot of videos out there about Greco's and is it as good as a Les Paul and Gibson versus Greco and all that kind of controversy? And I just want to speak to that before we get to the details of this guitar. My opinion is Gibson is Gibson and you know they're the originators and there's nothing like a Les Paul. But these these guitars and a lot of others measure up very nicely, very well. Uh, especially in an era where Gibson wasn't actually cranking out the best quality. You know, a lot of people complained about the pancake designs and the, the heft and the weight uh, from the guitars in the 70s, the New Orleans era, which I'm a fan of. I like all the Gibson eras, I'm gonna be honest. I am a Gibson fanboy. You'd make fun of me in the forums probably, but I'm gonna say something controversial. This is just as good, if not better, than many of the Les Pauls that I have and have owned. So, you know, it's true that they have good quality, they sound great, they play great, they feel really good. There's there's nothing to lose uh, in in taking a chance on one of these, especially older, you know, I'm gonna say late 70s through the 80s probably, you know, mid 80s anyway. These made in Japan, guitars out of the Fuji Gen factory and Matsumoku factories are just really, really great guitars. and I. And I got the bug a little bit. I don't need more guitars, but um, this one stuck out. I need to stop looking at guitars, and then I'll stop buying them. But, yeah, you know, so th this happened uh, before Fuji Gen, um, Greco, rather, came out with the Super Power. So that's what happened is, is in the 80s, they came out with the Super Power, which this black one here is. Um, and this is this is actually a very early... Uh, 78 it's a it was made in January so there's an A 
A is 1 January, B is 2 February, and so on. But, uh, yeah, they compare very nicely. I really like the tuners better on the 78. Uh, it's more like a Grover knockoff tuner as opposed to the kind of the vintage Cluson that they used um, on this particular EG500. But, yeah, uh, really great guitars. And I'm not sure this one's chambered. It's 9 pounds. And I took the pickups out, and it didn't really look like it was quote-unquote chambered. So, you know, the jury's out on that. I know they did chamber a lot of their guitars. But anyway, um, yeah, that's a lot of rambling. I just wanted to mention some of those things, and we'll take a deeper dive and a closer look into this guitar. Thanks for coming. Okay, okay. Thanks for coming by and welcome. This is a very interesting and unique top because, as I mentioned, it's sycamore. A sycamore wood is a tree that I grew up with in my backyard. It was actually quite huge and really big leaves that are a pain in the ass to rake. But look at the interesting grain on this piece of wood. It's just striking. There's a lot of flamey, curly-looking stuff going on here, um, particularly around the knob area here. Just really great colors. And I didn't use any filters or anything uh, on this. This is just my iPhone 12 pictures that I took, so it's nothing fancy going on. It's just really how it looks at different angles. I, I provide some video later to try to kind of capture it with the light. But just look at that. That is just so neat to me, you know, and, and unique. Even the Grecos, I had a hard time finding another one with a sycamore top. Um, pictures and images, reverb, eBay, whatever. But this one, it's just really, really outstanding to me. And it has, it has all the things that make it like a Les Paul. But, uh, you know, there, I don't, as far as I know, there wasn't any Les Pauls made with Gibson Les Pauls made with Sycamore. So that's pretty neat. I really like the, the Greco labeling on this. There's no superpower on the headstock, you'll see. It's, it, the standard, I thought at first, was some kind of aftermarket. But that is a Greco truss rod cover. And you can just see the red shades go into kind of an orange. And, you know, it's not a clown burst as a lot of people look at those Norland era Gibsons from the 70s that, you know, some people really like. Some people call it a clown burst because it's very yellow and very red and it kind of looks like the color of a clown, I guess. But this one just really spoke to me. The knobs are aftermarket. And you can see that it has a lot of honest play wear. The face, the, the top is not too bad. The back, however, is another story. Now, this thing looks like it's been run through the ringer. It's just got chips everywhere, like it was leaned up against something, banged up against something, belt buckle rash. You know, I don't think this is an artificial relic job. I mean, it's, it's a 1978 guitar from Japan, so I... I'm not sure what the purpose or point would be. That just seems like natural wear, but I'm just... It's interesting to to compare the amount of wear on the back as opposed to even the neck. There are some dings and dents in the neck, too, but the the top is in really good shape. Even at the top of the headstock here, where there's often a lot of wear... And these tuners are pretty nice. They're not very high ratio, but they're kind of shaler knockoffs. Uh, they're, they're effective. One of them is a little bent. I had thought about taking it apart and putting it back together again after bending it, but it's fully functional. So there you have it. A 1978 No Apologies Greco Les Paul with a sycamore top. Really cool. Hey, thanks for stopping by. Take care of yourselves now.